Hello there and welcome to the show. I trust you are well wherever you are watching us from. Now, in Nairobi, traffic snarlaps, congestion and confusion is still a major problem. How have cities like London dealt with this problem? Now, you'll be surprised to learn that a Kenyan brain was at the center of the transformation of London transport systems. Professor Washington Ocheng is our guest on the show today. We don't do research for research's sake. We actually uh, try as much as possible to have our work uh, go into practice. Professor Ocheng is the head of transport studies at the Imperial College London. That is one of the top universities in the UK. So sit back, relax, and be informed. But first, here is a look at the profile of Professor Ocheng and the university where he teaches. Imperial College London is a public research university. It was formed by the Royal Charter in 1907 and soon joined the University of London with a focus on science and technology. But it became an independent university from the University of London during its 100-year anniversary. Professor Washington Ocheng is one of the only two African lecturers at the university and the only one of the Kenyan origin. Kind of of the he is the head of the Center for Transport Studies here. The Kenyan scholar took time to show me some of the university's facilities and laboratories for transport studies. This was before he welcomed me to his office for a one-on-one -on -one interview in which he explained the role of his department in the improvement of London's transport. We are multimodal, that includes air, road, maritime, uh, but also active transport. The professor says there is a Kenyan connection here. We try to interact a lot. There, there, there could always be some more interaction. Um, so far we have interacted at the training level, so we have had a few Kenyan students coming here to study undergraduate and uh, MSc or master's degrees. Uh, but I'm also fairly active within the Kenyan community, particularly in London. The centre's relevance is attached to the fact that transport drives the world economy. We were part of the team that developed the first European navigation system. You know, everybody will be aware of GPS. Uh, they may not be aware that the Euro Europe also is developing its own efforts in that particular direction. So we were part of that. We were also uh, partners, if you like, played a very significant role in developing the London's congestion charge system um, that has now been in operation uh, since 2002-2003, very successfully so. Research shows that a lot of the signaling work that is being done in the world is using a system developed by the Imperial College. The metro side of transport, so underground trains, city trains, for example, in the railway sector, we are operating with 77 metros across the world. I'm a multifaceted person in terms of skills. I mean, I'm originally a civil engineer with a surveying, actually, background. Um, then later on, became a systems engineer, and I ended up uh, studying space sciences. Okay. So that actually, I also have a background in electrical engineering. So that actually makes me fairly versatile in terms of what I do. So in terms of my own particular contributions, which is one of the reasons I was made uh, a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, is that I was instrumental in the creation of the European, the first safety critical European navigation, space-based navigation system. This was during my time working in France for the French Space Agency and the European Space Agency. Um, I've also developed uh, what you might call SATNAV type algorithms and mathematical models uh, for the likes of BMW and the likes of Toyota. Okay, so there are quite a number of things. I'm also involved at the moment in transforming the way that air traffic management is done in Europe through something called the Single Sky European Initiative. You are watching the Chamada Report. Time now to get rolling on how transport systems in London work 
and how a Kenyan was involved in the transformation of the systems. In London, there is what is known as congestion charge. You are charged a certain fee if you enter a zone in the city where there is need to control traffic flow in order to reduce congestion. This was again, as a reminder, spearheaded by the Centre for Transport Studies at the Imperial College London, a centre headed by Professor Ochieng. The whole idea was to try to get London's traffic moving better. Okay, so basically the end game is free flow. So vehicles moving at the, des the design speeds for these particular networks. That's what you really want. Um, so introducing congestion charge had a way, if you like, of controlling travel behavior in such a way that you know, people who didn't need to travel at certain times didn't. Okay, so what, basically what you're calling a pawn is a way of controlling demand in that way. So, so, so basically what I'm saying is that the congestion charge in London as was done, was supported by a technology which only supports a, a relative fixed charge. And that, simply put, is cameras. So we have cameras installed, uh, which uses something called ANPR, um, Automatic Number Plate Recognition Technology, to basically identify when you have entered the zone. And if you're driving a certain type of car, you'll be charged eight pounds. Now, it doesn't matter how long you spend in there. So you could go there for five minutes and come out again. You'll pay eight. You could go in there and drive for 12 hours and pay eight pounds. So it's a fixed charge. Eight pounds converted into shillings is about 1,000 Kenyan shillings. You're given a certain period of time to pay the charge, and, and currently it's during the day. So you've got to pay it at some point during that day when you executed the trip. If you don't, then there will be something hefty. At one point it was 60 pounds. That means you will have to pay a penalty fee of about 9,000 shillings if you fail to pay the congestion charge. So we had, you know, improvements, you know, in the teams of percentages in terms of speed, for example, and later on settling down to around 10, 12 percent, um, which is, in the case of London, is very important. It's very significant. But I just want to make the point that, that one thing that people don't really think about when they introduce these schemes is the concept that there are people sitting out there who are not using it now, who will now use it because they feel that there's free space. We call that induced demand, uh, things that we need to control for. But for this to work, motorists need an alternative. There must be an affordable, safe and reliable public transport system, and that is what London implemented. Nairobi, on the contrary, is far from enjoying such a system. When I go to Nairobi, it's, it's uh, like a free-for-all, as you see. It, it, things appear to be chaotic in a way. Um, so I think I would say the first thing that needs to be done, if it hasn't been done already, is to produce a, a strategic um, and long-term transport master plan for the city. Um, the reason I say this is almost akin to saying, look, you know, before you do anything that addresses adequately the, the ills or the problems you have, you really have to put the initial house in order first. Um, now, that master plan would have to be underpinned by involving policymakers at the beginning, I would say, um, and the other stakeholders in the process. So we need to define what I call key performance areas. So these are the areas that we really have to be able to show and measure that the transportation net system that we put in place delivers. These key performance areas, the four main ones, are to do with one that responds to travel demand, so we could call that capacity. The other one is that we, while increasing that level of capacity or, or meeting the travel demand, we must not jeopardize safety. So we need to make sure that whatever we do improves safety at the same time. We also must be very sensitive to pollution. As we said earlier, one of the problems of congestion is environmental pollution, which is a, a killer. You know, it, there are so many diseases, etc., you know, that are coming out of pollution, for example. So we must not jeopardize uh, the environment. Now, that master plan itself has got to be truly seamless. It has got to be integrated. It's got to be multimodal, in a way. And it has to be phased. You know, this is to respond, basically, to the complexity of what you're looking at. So you decomplexify it, it phases, but also responds to the fact that we're a developing country and we can't afford to do everything at the same time. However, while many may admire the sophisticated transport systems, it may not be advisable.
to do a cut and paste job, warns Professor Ocheng. So there, are, there, are, there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, culture. Culture is a very interesting thing. Um, uh, I'll give you an example, for example. I mean, in, in London, is, you know, at least parts of London, it's very difficult to find litter on the ground. And the culture says that you, know, you dispose of it. That's what people do. Uh, in Nairobi, you may have problems associated with people littering. I mean, uh, this is just an example of cultural difference. Okay? So, for example, travel behavior. Understanding travel behavior is very important um, in the creation of a working transportation system. How, why people travel, where they go, travel activity, etc. And a lot of those are driven by culture. So what I'm actually saying, therefore, is that, that you know, when you're actually thinking of migrating or transferring something from a developed country from one culture to another, you really have to understand, first of all, the culture. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is that, that you know, the, the, the Western networks are actually ready to incorporate improvements, to incorporate new technology, new concepts. These are already defined because the networks and systems have been developed and improved over time. What we have in Africa or in Nairobi, for example, would be trying to take a fairly sophisticated, let's say, innovative technological solution into a legacy old one. And what we worry about in that respect is the potential for introducing failure modes yeah, when you integrate old to the new. So what we're actually saying, therefore, is that before you can actually take that new sophisticated technology, make sure that that legacy old system has been brought to a certain level where it, have, it, it can actually accept the new technology. When it comes to short-term measures that can be implemented, for example, in Nairobi City, the professor says, first, people must be made aware that walking and cycling can be a better alternative, especially on short distances. Mostly because, mostly because they are also healthy. They are healthy ways of actually traveling. That's interesting. The other, the other stuff that I would look at is, is effectively trying to make as much as possible, to reduce as much as possible uh, private, um, call them private, the need for private vehicles to enter the city where you have spaces outside the city which are very well served, parking spaces, let's say, or parking zones, which are very well served by shuttles, for example, into the city center. People will use them if they're comfortable, if they are on time and, and reliable, they will actually use them. Um, so that's one thing that could actually be used fairly easily to alleviate congestion within the city. The other short-term measure Professor Ocheng says he would put in place if given a chance to manage transport in Nairobi is traffic signals that are well synchronized and consistent as it is messy to have a system that at one moment is controlled by traffic police and at another moment by lights that are not well synchronized. This is how he described the Nairobi traffic signals. Very clumsy. Um, we can quickly move to a very, very optimally controlled traffic signal based system. Sometimes because traffic signals are not timed optimally, that in itself induces problems associated with congestion. So do we have the necessary infrastructure in place to enable the current network, the current network to improve or to achieve its maximum flow capacity. So we could, we could, this is looking at, you know, signaling, looking at timing of signaling and so forth. The emphasis is that people obey rules when there is some level of predictability. And then we have legal statutes, things that are actually legal in enforcing them. Okay. So what you don't want to have is that in one particular junction there is demarcation for do not enter, and in the other one there isn't. Because what that actually says to somebody is, okay, if they didn't put it in the second one, then maybe I, I shouldn't actually obey the first one. Mm -hmm. And that kind of scenario will be quite common in developing countries. Okay. So that kind of behavior, if you like, in terms of the provision of infrastructure, somehow influences the behavior of the driver in saying, if, if they don't care, I don't care either. So I think what you have to do is to provide transportation infrastructure with all the elements that are required everywhere. And then the second thing is you've got to enforce it. Okay. In the UK, I know I'll get a fine on the sport sometimes when I do certain things which are against the law in terms of traffic. So we don't do it. We take a short break. When we return, find out would the professor be willing to come back to Kenya in order to make a contribution to the transformation of transport systems in Nairobi? Don't go away.